this. It's October 19th, and a huge chunk of the internet, well, it just stops working. And I'm not talking about a small glitch here. This was a massive outage in one of the most critical data center regions on the entire planet, run by none other than Amazon Web Services. So let's get into it and deconstruct what really went down. To really grasp just how big a deal this was, you have to understand US East 1. That's the AWS region in Virginia, and, well, it's an absolute behemoth. We're talking about a single region that handles somewhere between 35 and 40% of all AWS traffic. So, yeah, when it goes down, the rest of the internet definitely feels it, big time. So what could possibly cause a digital blackout of this magnitude? You know, your mind immediately goes to something physical, right? A fire? Maybe a flood? Some kind of actual catastrophe? But the real answer is so much stranger and honestly, way more fascinating. It turns out a single internal monitoring tool kicked off a chain reaction that brought the entire region to its knees. So the big question is, how on earth is that even possible? All right, so let's start by setting the scene. We're talking about AWS's US East One region. Now to really understand why this outage was such a big, big deal, we gotta do a quick primer on how the cloud is supposed to be built for reliability in the first place. Okay, think of an AWS region like the one in Virginia, as a whole city. Now, inside that city, you've got multiple separate availability zones, or AZs. These are like independent neighborhoods, each with its own power grid and infrastructure. They're totally isolated data centers. So normally, if one AZ has a problem, say a power outage, the other AZs just pick up the slack and the city keeps running. But this outage, this was different. It took out the entire region. The whole city went dark. And that, well, that's just not supposed to happen. So you could just imagine the scene, right? AWS engineers are scrambling, starting their investigation. Everyone is desperately looking for that one single point of failure that could cause something so widespread. And what they eventually found was definitely not what anyone expected. So what was the real culprit? Get this, it wasn't a physical failure. The core services themselves, they were actually totally healthy. The real problem was a simple internal monitoring tool. Its entire job was just to check on the health of other services, but it basically started crying wolf. It was sending out all these false alarms, screaming that critical systems were down when in reality, they were running perfectly fine. And this right here is where a single tiny software bug spirals into a full-blown catastrophe. That one faulty tool, it kicked off this absolutely devastating domino effect that just rippled through the entire US East One ecosystem. Okay, so let me walk you through how this all went so wrong. Step one, you've got the false alarm from that rogue monitoring tool. Step two, because of that bad info, the system automatically updates its DNS records. You know, DNS is basically the internet's address book, and it fills them with incorrect data. Step three, that bad DNS update suddenly makes a super critical service called DynamoDB completely unreachable. And then the final domino. Since dozens of other AWS services rely on DynamoDB to function, they all started to fail, one after another. Now, you might not even use DynamoDB directly in your own apps, but here's the thing. AWS uses it internally for everything. Seriously, it's this foundational database that acts like the central nervous system for some of the most popular services on AWS. Its failure was literally the linchpin of this entire outage. And this is where you really see the massive blast radius. You've got services like IIM, which handles all your user identity stuff. It stores session tokens in DynamoDB. AWS Lambda, it keeps its function configurations there. API Gateway, ECR step functions. I mean, the list just goes on and on. All of them lean heavily on this one service. So when it suddenly became unreachable, they all started to tumble. So you'd think that once AWS pinpointed the faulty monitoring tool and started fixing it, things would start getting better, right? Well, actually, the problem got worse, and that's all thanks to a phenomenon that basically multiplied the impact across the entire network. This is where we get into something called a retry storm. See, most modern apps and SDKs are designed to be resilient. If a network request fails, what does it do? It automatically tries again, and again, and again. Now imagine tens of thousands of applications all doing this at the exact same time you get this massive self-inflicted flood of traffic that completely overwhelms the already struggling network. 
and this chart right here really shows the real-world impact of that storm. On one hand, you have AWS who reported that they had fixed the root cause in about two to three hours. But on the other hand, you have their customers, many of whom said their services were still down for up to 24 hours. They were just stuck in the aftermath of that retry storm, waiting for things like DNS caches to clear and for the network to finally stabilize. Okay, so now that the dust has settled, what are the big lessons here? What should developers and engineers really take away from this whole mess? And maybe just as interesting, what were the surprising financial consequences for AWS? All right, the big architectural takeaway is pretty clear. Using a multi-availability zone or multi-AZ setup, that is absolutely non-negotiable. It's just standard practice for high availability. But a full multi-region architecture? Well, that's a much, much bigger conversation. These complete region-wide outages are incredibly rare. The last major one was years ago, and the sheer cost and complexity of running your whole setup in multiple regions might just not be worth it to protect against something that happens so infrequently. Okay, let's talk about the money side of things. Like pretty much all cloud services, DynamoDB has what's called a service level agreement, or SLA. It's basically a promise from AWS about uptime. For DynamoDB, that promise is 99.99% availability, which only allows for a few minutes of downtime in a whole month. This outage, it lasted over two hours. So yeah, that was a pretty clear breach of their own agreement. So what happens when they breach that SLA? Well, it means service credits. According to their own rules, customers who were affected by this level of downtime could be eligible to claim back 10% of their monthly DynamoDB bill. And for big companies spending tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, that is not a small amount of money. You know, at the end of the day, this whole outage is just a powerful reminder of something we tend to forget. We build our entire digital world on these incredibly complex layered systems. And sometimes a single faulty line of code in some obscure monitoring tool can be enough to shake the very foundations of the internet. It really makes you stop and think, doesn't it? What other invisible systems are we all depending on every single day without- Let's talk about something huge that happened back on October 19th and 20th. All of a sudden, a massive chunk of the internet just stopped working. And no, it wasn't your Wi-Fi. It was a major outage at Amazon Web Services, you know, AWS, which is basically the invisible backbone for tons of apps and websites we all use every single day. So in this explainer, we're going to break down what exactly went wrong, why it happened, and what it really tells us about this cloud that we've all come to depend on. So just imagine this for a second. You go to log into your favorite app or maybe load a website or even just access a tool for work and you get nothing, just a spinning wheel. Well, for millions of people, that was their reality. Services that are usually totally reliable were suddenly gone. It was a real digital mystery and all the first clues were pointing to a failure deep, deep inside the internet's core infrastructure. And listen, this wasn't just some minor glitch. We are talking about a staggering 35 to 40% of all traffic that flows through Amazon's massive cloud platform. To give you some perspective on that, AWS handles billions and billions of requests every day. So we're looking at hundreds of millions of operations just failing. The sheer scale of this is what makes it one of the biggest cloud outages we've seen in years. Okay, so to solve this mystery, we have to go right to the scene of the crime. The failure wasn't happening everywhere at once. It actually started in one very specific and very important digital location. Let's figure out exactly where that first domino fell. The epicenter of this whole thing was a region known as US East One, located in Virginia. Now, you have to understand, this isn't just any data center hub. US East One is one of the oldest, one of the biggest, and one of the most critical regions in the entire AWS global network. It's kind of like the Grand Central Station of the internet. When something goes wrong here, trust me, the entire internet feels it. So to really get why this was so bad, we need a quick lesson in what I like to call cloud geography. Just think of an AWS region as a whole city, in this case, Virginia. Now inside that city, you have multiple totally separate data centers called availability zones or AZs. Think of these like different neighborhoods. This whole design exists specifically to prevent major outages. And that is what made this event so wild. I mean, a single neighborhood, an AZ, going down because of a power cut or something, that's a scenario they plan for. Other AZs are designed to just pick up the slack, no problem. But this event, it took out the entire city. The whole Virginia region was in trouble. And that is something that is just not supposed to happen. Okay, so we know where it happened, but now we get to the fun part, the how. 
To really understand the root cause, we've got to introduce three key technical players in this whole drama. Let's line them up and call them our primary suspects. First up, we've got DNS, the domain name system. The absolute easiest way to think about DNS is that it's the internet's phone book. When you type in a website, DNS looks up the name and directs your request to the right server's IP address. Simple as that. It's the traffic controller for, well, the entire internet. Suspect number two is an internal AWS monitoring tool. This thing is like a health inspector. Its only job is to constantly check on all the AWS services to see if they're running okay. And here's the crucial part. It's this tool that tells DNS, our phone book, which servers are healthy and ready to receive traffic. And now for our final and honestly most critical suspect, DynamoDB. This is a super, super important database service. You might not even use it directly, but AWS itself uses it as a fundamental building block for so many of its other major services. It's truly the bedrock that a lot of the cloud is built on. And this right here shows you just how critical DynamoDB really is. It's not just some standalone service. It is the hidden engine behind user authentication, serverless code, software containers, and so much more. The point is, when DynamoDB has a problem, all of these other services that depend on it, they start to crumble too. Okay, the stage is set, we've met our suspects, we've got DNS, the traffic op, the monitoring tool, our health inspector, and DynamoDB, the foundational database. It is time to reveal the culprit and the absolutely surprising chain of events it kicked off. So here's the crazy part. The culprit was the health inspector. The internal monitoring tools started sending false reports, claiming that perfectly healthy DynamoDB servers were actually down. It then told the DNS phone book to just rip those pages out. So DNS did what it was told and stopped sending traffic to perfectly good servers. And because so many other services rely on DynamoDB, well, that triggered a massive cascading failure across the entire region. But hold on, the story doesn't end there. The initial problem was really bad, right? But what made it so much worse, what really prolonged the pain, was an accomplice, something called a retry storm. Think about it like this. When a website doesn't load for you, what do you do? You hit refresh, right? Maybe a few times. Well, imagine millions of automated programs doing the exact same thing, but hundreds of times a second. This absolute flood of retries created a digital traffic jam of epic proportions. Even after AWS fixed the root problem, this retry storm completely overwhelmed the DNS servers. That's why a fix that should have taken maybe two or three hours ended up leaving some people offline for more than 24 hours. So the mystery is solved. But what's the big takeaway from all this? This outage actually gives us some really critical lessons about building things on the cloud and about the financial promises that hold it all together. So naturally, the first question everyone asks is, how do we make sure this never, ever happens again? Well, the ultimate protection is something called a multi-region setup. That's basically having a complete copy of your entire system running in another city. It's incredibly resilient, but it is also incredibly expensive and complex to manage. And since these region-wide failures are so rare, the last one was years ago, for most businesses, it's just not worth the cost. Sticking to that multi-AZ, multi-neighborhood setup is still the sensible way to go. Now, let's talk about the money. Cloud providers have these contracts called Service Level Agreements, or SLAs. They are, quite literally, a promise of uptime. For DynamoDB, AWS promises 99.99% .99 uptime. That translates to a maximum of about 4.3 minutes of downtime per month. If they break that promise, they owe their customers a service credit, in this case, 10% of their bill. And this chart just shows you the huge gap between the promise and the reality of what happened. The allowed downtime under that contract was just a little over four minutes. The actual outage lasted for more than two hours. I mean, that is a clear-cut breach of their own service level agreement. So what does that all mean? It means any paying customer who was seriously impacted by the DynamoDB outage was eligible to claim a 10% credit on their monthly bill for that service. Now, it's not automatic, you do have to ask for it, but that's the financial consequence when a failure of this magnitude happens. Ultimately, this whole event is just a powerful reminder. We've built our entire modern digital world on these incredibly complex, interconnected cloud platforms. And they are remarkably resilient, most of the time, but they are not infallible. And it really leaves all of us with a crucial question to think about. When the cloud, this invisible foundation of our lives, actually fails.